for your time and all the energy spent in preparing for this event, and most especially um, our own John Matthews, our organist, who has done the lion's share of all the preparation for this. Um, and it, we have wonderful music uh, planned for us today. Um, just a friendly reminder to mute your cell phones now, uh, so as we sing and, and uh, uh, enjoy these hymns, we won't be interrupted by that. Um, and then if um, you're not familiar with our facility here, if between pieces you do need to get up to um, go to the restroom, uh, the restrooms are easiest to access through this door here, the exit in the back, and then once you go through the fellowship area there, there's a hallway um, just to the right. Go down the hallway, you'll see the restrooms uh, there on the right. Uh, they're easy to, easy to access um, that way. I'll have John come forward. He has a little introductory information as well. Thank you, John. Thank you, Pastor. It's, uh, it's good to see you here on a beautiful afternoon. I know that you could have been elsewhere outdoors, uh, but I'm also thankful it's not raining because that would have given another reason for people to not be here. So grateful for your presence and uh, thankful for your voice in advance because you've got a lot of singing to do this afternoon. So in hymn festivals, we, uh, are, uh, we do stanza assignments for many reasons, but not the least of which is the variety. Uh, and sometimes it's interpretation of the text, but also uh, to give you some vocal rest when we've got 49 hymn stanzas to sing. I, I keep track of that kind of thing in these programs. And um, the other thing is no organist worth their salt would play the hymn all on one sound. So it makes sense that we would put vocal variety in there as well. I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Reese Land at University of Louisville for helping us put together the uh, Louisville Brass this afternoon, and I've been with them since 1 o'clock today. I can tell you you're in for a treat. The classical saxophone and the flute that are with me, we've been working together over 30 years, and they've been involved in numerous commissions. And the uh, vocal group that's helping us, uh, some of our history goes back a long ways as well. Grateful for all of their assistance today. Uh, all of the uh, musical settings that are listed as settings by Kevin Hildebrand were commissions that have been uh, commissioned to be written in the past uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, Kevin is now a cantor at our um, uh, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, one of the most gifted musicians in the center today, and just a delightful individual. I always look forward to our visits when I go up to Fort Wayne for Good Shepherd Institute each November. And uh, that's the, the friendship just grew out of that. And uh, he's an active composer. He was long before we started working together. But I've probably got about 15 pieces commissioned, some of which have been published by CPH, our publishing house in St. Louis. Morningstar has picked up a few. And we're hoping to start resuming the process of commissioning uh, works. Those have been made possible by various things in previous churches. It could be uh, a grant foundation in a church that has funds that you can apply for. Uh, individuals have funded commissions. Households have funded commissions. And if there's anybody that has interest in that, I'd be happy to chat with you about it because uh, it's a neat opportunity to expand our church's already outstanding repertory of, um, of literature uh, by Lutheran composers. And so we're celebrating Easter today. We're celebrating God's gift of music. I would submit that we're also celebrating the gift of Lutheran service book. Everything we're doing today is from this book. And uh, I had the opportunity to teach this hymnal for six years before it was published. And there isn't a hymnal in existence that I would prefer to be using than the one we do every week. I thank God that the Commission on Worship sustained through a very challenging time in the life of our synod to come out with one of the finest hymnals in the world. So give thanks for that every time you pick it up on Sunday mornings and you celebrate it well by singing it well. Every time we sing hymns, I uh, am thankful for the participatory nature of this congregation. We start out with something that's actually not Easter, but it would be late epiphany. Uh, if you'll turn in your program, the prelude on Putnam, the term, uh, the name Putnam in all caps means it's the name of a hymn tune. And if you'll turn in your hymnals to number, hymn number 403, 403, 
This is the tune on which this three movement piece is based. I selected this to start the service because only pastors, the other person that knows how many times this, how many metamorphoses this program has gone through. Um, we were, I was looking at seasons of the church here, but this hymn would be a hymn that you might use in the late Epiphany season leading into Lent. Uh, it's a lovely tune by a, um, a, a friend and colleague of mine in, um, uh, in New York, uh, Stephen Johnson, and uh, uh, just a, a wonderful melody. And I asked Kevin Hildebrand to uh, write uh, an instrumental trio on it for use at an Epiphany Hymn Festival. I think it was in 2014 or 13. And what you're about to hear is a result, and it might be one of the finest things I've ever heard on this tune. So a three-movement selection on the hymn tune, Putnam, will begin our, um, our service. And then uh, the rationale for two Lenten hymns is that these are, this is an Easter hymn festival, hymns for the Easter cycle, which includes Lent and Holy Week. And so the uh, Jesus grant that balm and healing is the uh, Lenten hymn, and then the hymn for Holy Week, the Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth, another commission by Kevin Hildebrand, using uh, classical saxophone and flute and uh, choir and congregation. So all the directives are there for each stanza on the hymns. And if you're wondering about terminology, stanza is each numbered portion of the text on the page. The verse is the entire collection of words on the page. So you'll hear, sometimes hear verse and stanza change, used interchangeably, but they really aren't. <laughs> um, so we begin with the uh, triptych on Putnam.
The first of the two Lenten selections uh, are, is Jesus Grant That Balm and Healing, hymn number 421. So as I read this commentary, I invite you to open to the hymn so you're prepared as we sing it. Jesus Grant That Balm and Healing was written by Johann Hiermann and published in 1644. Inspired by the manual of St. Augustine, the focus of the hymn is resistance to temptation empowered by the gospel. For this reason, the first three stanzas serve well as a daily prayer, especially for the beginning of the day. Since Christ bore all our sins, griefs, and sorrows in his body upon the cross, we are healed by his suffering and death that he endured on our behalf. It is in this, that confidence we pray, deliver us from evil. That prayer is fundamental to daily repentance of which this hymn is concerned. Therefore, it is associated with Lent, but is appropriate to other seasons, as well as such as the long season of Pentecost. The first stanza and first half of the second are concerned with temptations of the flesh. Stanza one begins, remembering the wounds of Christ are a healing balm from any pain of body or mind. Just as we confess sins of thought, word, and deed, the hymn guides us to pray that, that should evil thoughts arise, we should not fall into sin. Stanza two especially concerns itself with the temptation of the younger Christians as it confesses that lust can fascinate our sinful minds. The hymn pleads that Jesus draw us closer to his cross and passion to give us new courage. We then pray and confess that as Christ resisted and thwarted the devil in the wilderness by the word of God, so the Lord provide, will pro provide the way of escape for us through his word, confounding the devil by the power of Christ's passion. The third stanza turns our attention to the temptations in the world. The enticements and seductions of the world are many, so we consider the load of sin that Jesus bore for us and all the world upon the cross. Such remembrance and prayer brings us peaceful meditation. When our sinful natures, the devil and the world are unable to entice us, there are always the pains and sorrows of the body. Stanza four offers a rich prayer for those who suffer bodily pain and sickness. The wounds of Christ are a balm of healing for all that wounds the body and the soul. We who are baptized into Christ share in both the suffering and the resurrection of Christ and are therefore comforted. The comfort Jesus imparts renders sweet the trials and tribulations we Christians face. The hymn brings to mind the story of Thomas, who was brought from unbelief to confident faith and joyful confession of Christ by testimony of his wounded hands and side. It is by the proclamation of his death and resurrection that Christ Jesus sustains us in the face of all temptations and sin, and finally death, which is the concern of the fifth stanza. Trusting Christ's death and our death, we know that death has lost its power. Because Christ is risen, he is our protection, our light in life and resurrection. Hence the hymn ends with the resurrection, in which the help and comfort of the gospel are manifested against all manner of temptation.
goes uncomplaining forth. First published in 1647, A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth was written by Paul Gerhardt. The date of writing lends insight into the deeper context of the hymn. The devastating 30 years war was ending. Berlin was politically tense due to the ruler's abandonment of Lutheranism in favor of Calvinism. This hymn was collected by J.G. Ebeling in a compilation of Gerhardt's hymns and was appointed for Good Friday. Many consider it the most significant Good Friday, t Good Friday text in Lutheran hymnody. The hymn is a profound example of gospel comfort that has strengthened the faithful for generations. One example is the story of Hildegard Schader. She was arrested in 1944 by the Nazis and condemned for the gas chamber for aiding and abetting the Jews. She survived her imprisonment and recalled that she frequently whispered the lyrics of A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth in prayer from the hymnal of her heart to comfort and sustain her during her tribulations. The core truth of God's love expressed in the sacrifice of the Lamb has helped many in times of war and sorrow. The four stanzas are a dialogue between God the Father and the Son, leading Christ towards the obedient sacrifice motivated by divine love. Such an action leads the believer to ponder the fathomless love which is Christ. The faithful enter the conversation then exclaiming, O wondrous love, what have you done? The Father offers up his Son. Desiring our salvation, O love, how strong you are to save. You lay the one into the grave who built the earth's foundation. The hymn concludes with the anticipation of an eternal union with the Lord as the bride of Christ in the throne room of the new heaven and earth. Beyond all sin, suffering, pain, or sorrow in this life, the Christian anticipates salvation in Christ that leads to heavenly joy.
as we've concluded our two Lenten hymns, we were going to take a moment to give an update to the congregation of Concordia um, about our DCE interned efforts and also our capital reserve fund efforts. Uh, the original idea behind this event was to make it really centered on that, those, those efforts, but those efforts are going well. And um, speaking to John and the congregation, everybody's like, we would sing hymns anyway, so it's a reason to gather. But we want to take this opportunity just to update the congregation a little bit. So this is for the congregation guests. So um, any, it's, it's going to mention some money and donations. This is not an expectation or a pitch from the congregation. <laughs> I wanted to make that clear, but it's just informative for us. And um, I hope maybe you hear it and say, well, that sounds like exciting plans for our congregation. Um, our president, Russ Pro, is going to speak first, and then I'll have a little update on the DCE intern as well. To begin this discussion, I want to remind you of the Founders Day luncheon we had and the Archives Committee putting out the history of the building particularly the old school building and how, it, and how this sanctuary was built. You'll remember that this church began in a church kitty-cornered from Slugger Field, just down by the river. And when they decided they needed a school, there was not enough space at that place to have a school. So they bought the property here and built the school. And of course, during the services on Sunday, they used the parts of the school for the congregational effort. <clears throat> In about 1928, the congregation changed, well, prior to that, they changed their name to the, from the German Lutheran uh, Church of Louisville to Concordia Lutheran. And of course, there are historical political reasons for changing that name, and of course, the services also began to be in English instead of German. So in 1928, the congregation realized they needed a real sanctuary and that the, church, that the school had some limitations that as a congregation they you know, took away from the spirituality of the activity. And so they built a plan to build this, this edifice here in a Gothic style. They had plans for putting in the organ, for putting in the the uh, wonderful stained glass windows. And then 1929 came. And they were in the middle of the depression building a church. But to know that this church was able to carry on its work, it was dedicated in December 7th, 1930. So they had as a congregation had the forewithal to complete the job, regardless of the financial situation. That was, that time was 90 years ago. And through these times, the congregation has profited from having this wonderful church because of the ambiance, the attraction that it has for people. But the board, board of trustees have always had a continued job of making sure that the boilers work, that they don't rust out. So over 90 years, the congregation last fall was faced with the fact that the trustees scratched their head and said, it's now time, we have to address the boilers. And so in the December's voters assembly meeting, the board of elders and the treasurer came up with a plan about how we should borrow $120,000 in order to pay off the boilers. We had about half of the money already put aside, but we needed the remainder. And the voters assembly also said, you should begin having a special drive for funds outside of the normal budget and ask the parishioners to consider could they help in defraying that. So the first item that I'll tell you about is that the congregation has responded and has provided a little over, well, almost $17,000 to pay down that part of it. So between the, between the money we had set aside plus the money that we donated, we only had to take out a $90,000 loan. And the plan is for us to continue asking our parishioners to consider the possibility of giving to the Lord to help pay this off even sooner than the three to five years we plan. So praise the Lord, a good outcome. 
However, the difficulty came is that in our, in our mission planning, we had wanted to recruit another minister, particularly a DC, a director of Christian education, to come and help build our family and children programs. Because if we can build our family and, and children programs, we hope that that will help us continue our growth. And the, the call committee for the DCE, which is comprised of the elders plus three other members of the congregation, <clears throat> were faced with the fact that we didn't have, based on pledges, enough funds to cover a full line for a DCE. And they then considered options and came up with a really wonderful plan of trying to bring in a DCE intern. This is a person who's just completed their, all of their coursework for becoming a DCE, and coming to be an intern would be their in, in uh, service training uh, to finish off their degree work. And uh, they also came up with a plan that there was a family foundation that had a potential gift to the congregation which would be matching funds up to $20,000. And if we could attain $40,000, it would be sufficient funds to cover the DCE interns uh, pay plus housing plus all the activities they'd be involved in. And so the elders, uh, the call committee put this forward to the congregation. In January, the congregation said, yes, move forward and please begin a DCE fund recruitment so that we could have those over $40,000 so that a DCE intern can come, have their last training in our congregation working closely with pastor, and then put us in a position that maybe we would be then ready by doing some extra stewardship and such to be able to have a full line for the DCE a minister. And so we began that activity and to date we've had a uh, little over $15,000 come in for that fund. So we're almost we're $5,000 away from hitting our, our target goal on the DCE fund. And I, so I think it's quite interesting that even in the midst of the depression, this congregation was able to rise to the, the need to build this wonderful uh, structure. And even though the boilers groaned and the poor trustees had to coax the boilers to keep working over 90 years, we were able to take out a loan, pay down part of it already, call the DCE intern and put us in a position where we can help build our family and youth programs plus other act, spiritual activities that this minister will bring in. It gives pastor a trainee to keep him sharp as well. And uh, so the outcome of this was really great. And I'd really like to thank John Matthews and pastor gave him some help to put on this event because it really is, allows us to tell the congregation how wonderful the Lord has blessed us and allowed us to move forward uh, with our faith in him. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Well, that's a good segue, uh, Russ, when you said a uh, DCE will help keep our pastor sharp. Uh, I just came from this past weekend uh, visiting Chicago, going to Con Con Concordia University, Chicago, and spent two days with our future deaconess intern, Grace Conrad, and boy, I saw, she, she opened my mind even more to the potential of team ministry together with the director of Christian education. She had ideas that, that uh, were just flowing and, and all the potential uh, that we could have in the future of having a DCE here. And of course, our prayer is that, that Grace might, uh, after her internship, see that she, this is the place God is calling her to and that it's a good fit. Um, that's, of course, our, our desire is that it might be able to convert um, to, a, to a call um, if it's right for her and right for us and so forth. Um, so it, it's, she's a wonderful young lady, kind, obviously loves children, um, a very level-headed, uh, uh, somebody who likes to think and plan, and one who has a Christ-centered heart, who loves people and, and, and is so joyful. And again, we had such a great conversation, and she asked me a few questions, like, I didn't even think about that, right? Yeah, she, she has a lot of ideas, and, and she's very excited to get here and has been praying for our congregation. Just a little bit on timeline, she's got two more weeks 
of school left um, right now. So she's got to concentrate on her studies. I'm trying not to bother her too much. We've, we started creating objectives over this weekend while we were together. It was one of the things that Dr. Arfston, the director of the program there, had us do, and it was really exciting. But now she's got to set that aside and focus on graduating because senioritis is really, you know, kicked in for all those four uh, candidates now. Um, but and after that, in time, um, I'll start having our leadership and those who are going to be working with her introduce themselves to her before she gets here. We're looking at her moving into town in Louisville sometime probably mid-June, and then her uh, uh, full, first day, so to speak, and reception into the congregation um, as our DCE intern will occur on June 26th. So I'll uh, uh, keep that in mind and try to be here for that. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have a welcome party and some festivities for her. We also have a family day, uh, outing on that day. So I thought that would be perfect too. We can have a fellowship meal and then go to our family fun outing and she can spend some time with everybody. I think we're going to the Falls of Ohio for that one, if I remember right. It's gonna be a nice outdoor activity. And that's gonna be um, a lot of fun. Our DCE um, search committee is currently looking for housing for our um, intern, for Grace, uh, and we've got some potential things. A lot of people have asked me about that. We're seeking it and trying to find a nice, safe neighborhood and something convenient to the church, you know, 10 to 15 minute commute. Um, we're not gonna put her over in Indiana where Pastor lives or anything like that, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but with that being said, please keep those efforts in your prayers and um, blessings to all of you. Thank you, everyone um, who has, has, has donated and continues to donate. Um, just a note and a reminder for a donation of any amount um, you get a framed uh, picture of this print that's there on the front of your bulletin a very nice um, uh, a reprint of this painting done by uh, uh, Dr. Eber I mean Pastor Eberhard's son um, and there's an example of one of those framed uh, paintings uh, prints out in the fellowship hall so afterwards when we gather for some time of fellowship you can you can see it there well, now our program will continue. I'm going to go off script for a minute. And would it be inappropriate to stand for any of the hymns, John? The more the better. The more the better. I think it would help to stretch our legs and, and, and so on. So perhaps on this next one, we, we will stand for it. Will that work, John? I apologize to go off script, but I think stretching our legs, it keeps us awake and, and sitting this time. So, so uh, our next hymn is 463, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, Alleluia. Attributed to uh, uh, Whippo of Burgundy, Christ the Lord is Risen Today was written sometime in the 10th century. Interspersed with the Easter cry, Alleluia, this text is an invitation to the Paschal Feast. The hymn begins with a summons to worship with the angelic announcement, Christ is risen today. It is a gracious invitation to celebrate the Paschal Lamb sacrifice and victory. Therefore, it is especially appropriate for an opening hymn on Easter Day, or presently, our first Easter hymn at this festival. The second stanza blends and contrasts a number of biblical images. The Passover lamb bleeds for the sheep, combining the Baptist cry that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The atoning exchange of Christ's perfect life for our sinful lives is voiced when we sing, sinless in the sinner's stead. Finally, life and death are contrasted for the living Christ who died in the sinner's stead has risen no more to die proving that since death has no power over him, it is powerless over the baptized. The third stanza exhorts the faithful to offer praise to the victim of the Passover lamb, the lamb who was slaughtered and whose blood covers sinners, reconciling them to God. The motif of contrasting death and life teaches that sinners are reconciled to God by the strange and awesome strife when Jesus suffered the bitterness of death and that, that we deserved and atoned for our sins and rose triumphantly. The final stanza draws the hymn back from the first Easter to the Paschal Feast that the church celebrates, calling Christians to offer grateful homage in thanksgiving for the forgiveness of sins, which Christ's resurrection from the dead won for them. The stanza closes by joyfully and confidently reiterating the resurrection themes of stanza two and concludes Jesus now lives no more to die.
Thank you. 
what we did there for the sports fan is, is the Lutheran version of the wave. You know, up and down. Our, our next uh, hymn is hymn number 478, the, the Day of Resurrection. The author of the Day of Resurrection, John of Damascus, was an outstanding theologian of the early 8th century. John's exposition of scripture influenced all Christian theologians of succeeding centuries in both the Eastern and Western traditions of the church. John was more than an academic, though. Like Martin Luther after him, John of Damascus was a churchman and a hymn writer. The Day of Resurrection repeatedly exhorts all creation to join in praising the Lord. This is especially emphasized in the first lines of stanzas one and three and the entirety of stanza four. It is similar to a psalm of praise like Psalm 98 that entreats the faithful, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth, break forth into joyous song and praise. This hymn sounds the joyous opening note of Easter celebration. In stanza one, lines three through four, the translator refers to the Passover of gladness and the Passover of God. In Greek, Pascha means both Passover and Easter, and the choice of the translator to render it Passover is, an unexpected, as, is, is as much unexpected as it is warranted. The connection is especially meaningful when the hymn is sung at the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday, where the sermon could make explicit the typological connection of the Old Testament Passover to Christ's Passover from Holy Week to Easter.
Our next hymn is number 461, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. Samuel Medley published over four dozen hymn texts in his lifetime. He penned, I Know That My Redeemer Lives in his later life, reflecting on the many comforts and joys the resurrection of Christ has given him. Medley, who served in the British Navy, was injured in a battle with the French in 1759. His wounded leg was to be amputated, but after prayer, his leg miraculously healed. This experience drew Medley closer to his Redeemer, and he became a Baptist preacher. The eight stanzas of the hymn are united by the phrase, He lives. This echoes Job's marvelous exclamation, I know that my Redeemer lives. The first and last lines repeat this affirmation of confident assurance and joyous resurrection faith. This Easter hymn is frequently sung at funeral services because of its assurance and bold confidence in the resurrection of the dead. Stanza 1 concerns itself with the teaching of Job chapter 19. In Job's declaration of his Redeemer's victory over death, he confesses the objective certainty of the resurrection of the body. Job believed that though he would die, the Lord would raise his body to life so he would see God face to face. Job's words expressed the confidence that God would purchase him back, or in other words, redeem him from sin and death. Jesus accomplished this through his cross. His resurrection seals the redemption of the entire world, and all who believe this gospel receive the Redeemer's forgiveness and salvation. Therefore, he lives as the, church, the, the church's ever-living head. In the second stanza, Medley maintains a lofty view of Christ's resurrection and triumphantly points to Christ's victory. Following St. Paul's words, he assures us of our Savior's victorious and exalted state. The ascending Lord of glory is now seated at the right hand of the Father as King. The third stanza recalls that he rules to bless the church. The resurrection has many personal implications for individual sinners. He lives to plead for me above. He lives lives my hungry soul to feed. He lives to help in time of need. In stanza four, the personal comfort continues. Christ provides help, guidance, and sustenance. Hearing echoes of Jesus' promise and revelation to take away all sorrow and tears, stanza five reminds us that true peace resides in Christ. Such promises gave calm to troubled hearts. Yearning for a fulfillment of these promises, stanza six references Christ's threefold office as prophet, priest, and king, which give added comfort, for Jesus is our kind, wise, heavenly friend. Stanza seven reminds the hearer that the resurrection guarantees life now and in the future. Daily we experience the forgiving gift of Christ's spirit. Christ sustains our lives now and prepares a place in heaven for each of us. Medley returns to his chief purpose in the final stanza, giving glory to Christ, the unchanging Savior. We sing Job's words once more, strongly affirming the comfort and hope Christians experience during the Easter season and at every funeral of a believer.
next hymn is hymn number 467, Awake My Heart with Gladness. This Paul Gerhardt Easter hymn is personal testimony of the gladness of Christ's resurrection. Though German immigrants brought Gerhardt's German hymns with them to America, it was in England that his many texts were translated. John Kelly first translated Awake My Heart with Gladness in 1867 in a collection called Paul Gerhardt's Spiritual Songs. Ever since, Gerhardt has been beloved by English-speaking Christians, and Kelly's translation has been modified with each succeeding, succeeding hymnal. Early Reformation hymns focused on Luther's teaching universally and objectively, being careful to employ the collective pronouns we, our, and us. A century later, Gerhardt wrote more personally, using the pronouns I, my, and me frequently. So stanza one begins by speaking to one's own heart to be cheered for the grave where the Savior laid was in fact where our bed must be made. Stanza two is reminiscent of Colossians chapter two, verse 14. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. However, the imagery of a hero's victory banner is lost in translation in some modern settings. The remaining stanzas testify to the joyful confidence of the truths of Romans 8, verses 35 through 39, that following Christ, our leader, we are free from sin, the power of death, and the world, and therefore are protected from all evil. We remember that nothing is able to separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus. The final stanza brings the believer to the portal of bliss untold, for we are buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The last lines of stanza 7 paraphrase Christ's words in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And after the instrumental setting of Awake My Heart, um, with gladness, I'll invite us to stand again for this hymn and for the, the final hymn um, of our program, um, hymn number 458 after that.
final hymn for our hymn festival is hymn number 458, Christ Jesus Lay in Death Strong, Death Strong Bands. This hymn is an expansion by Martin Luther of Christ is Arisen, which we find in Lutheran service book hymn number 459. The hymn begins by echoing the words of St. Luke in Acts chapter 2. God raised him up, loosing the, pound, the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Christ's resurrection brings us life and salvation, as Isaiah the prophet preached. He will swallow up death forever. In faith, the Christian joyfully praises the Lord. Stanza 2 is filled with the law's harshest condemnation of sin and its consequence, death. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. In stanzas 3 and 4, Luther restates poetically what, had, what he had written in, the 15, in 1520 in The Freedom of a Christian, one of his most popular writings. The excerpt, similar to these stanzas, reads, Here we have a most pleasing vision, not only of communion, but of a blessed struggle in victory and salvation and redemption. Christ is God and man in one person. He has neither sinned nor died and is not condemned, and he cannot sin, die, or be condemned. His righteousness, life, and salvation are unconquerable, eternal, omnipotent. By the wedding ring of faith, he shares in the sins, death, and pains of hell, which are his brides. He suffered, died, and descended into hell, that he might overcome them all. Now, since it was such a one who did all this, and death and hell could not swallow him up. These were necessarily swallowed up by him in a mighty duel. For his righteousness is greater than the sins of all men, his life stronger than death, his salvation more invincible than hell. In stanza five and six, Luther captures the biblical teaching of the Passover lamb and its connection to Christ's victory on the cross over sin, death, and hell. Finally, in stanza seven, he interprets the Passover lamb imagery in light of the sacrament of the altar. Christ alone our souls will feed. He is our meat and drink indeed. Faith lives upon no other. Each stanza of the hymn ends with the bold Easter acclamation, Alleluia. This hymn entreats us all to praise the Lord, for he is victorious over sin, death, and the power of Satan. And now I invite you to stand.
Yeah, that concludes our program, but before we uh, go to the fellowship hall for some, uh, or fel fellowship gathering area for, for some uh, light refreshments and time together, um, first and foremost, I, I want to uh, first say, I know John would say this, um, all glory be to God alone. Um, however, the Lord has uh, uh, given us together and the gift of music to give him glory together, and we thank you for all of you coming with your voices to sing. And most of all, I want to give John our thanks uh, today. First, John, can you come out from there for a minute so everyone can see you? No, he won't. <laughs> thank, thank you for all of our um, instrumentalists this day. On, uh, we had a flute and, and uh, a classical saxophone player, and we also had our brass ensemble. Uh, thank you so much for blessing us with that music and that time. Um, and last but not least, uh, for this wonderful time, uh, thank you to our quartet for leading us in song. Thank you so much for being here. And we welcome all of you, of course, in the name of the Lord. Um, the uh, other things I just wanted to mention real quick, uh, this uh, uh, event would not have been possible without the uh, generous donation of an anonymous donor who um, loves to bless our music ministry and so on. So um, my thanks to them. And, and thanks to Lydia, too, who put together the programs and also uh, was a big help to John getting music printed and organized and everything like that. I know he would thank you personally, but since, I, since I've got the mic, I would mention it. And he said it was a huge help. So anyway, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>